Christian Parenting. Hello and welcome to the Growing Connected podcast. My name is Amy Ulrich and I'm here with my husband, Jeffrey Ulrich. Jeffrey is a child psychologist and we are parents and authors and together we've written the book, The Six Needs of Every Child, Empowering Parents and Kids Through the Science of Connection. In my work as a therapist, I see both the joy and the pain families experience in their journey together. We all feel stuck and disconnected at times. This season, we're talking about the concepts we present in our book and discussing the exciting ways we see faith and science coming together to help point our families to health and connection. Last week, we talked about attachment science and how it reveals that kids are born with two competing instincts, the instinct to move away from us and explore the world when things are going well for them, and also the instinct to come back close to draw near to us to regroup when things are hard. These are opposite movements, so they can be really confusing to us if we don't understand them, and that confusion can lead to a lot of conflict and disconnection in our families. So we've created a six needs compass of connection as a tool for parents to use as they guide their child's growth. In his work as an attachment researcher, Jeffrey has identified three things our kids need in order to healthily explore and learn to master their world, delight, support, and boundaries. This week, we'll be talking about the need for delight because on the six needs compass, that's where the journey begins. We'll first introduce some concepts of delight together, then we'll invite our friend, best-selling author, creative, and mom of three, Kelly Hampton, into the conversation. Jeffrey, understanding how much our children scientifically need to feel our delight in them really changed everything for me. Yeah, delight is really fascinating. Attachment researchers are measuring different things that are going on when we measure attachment and interactions between a caregiver and their child. And... One of the things that early on in attachment research was flagged as something that might be important is parental delight. And that was different from affection. So like touchy, feely, lovey, dovey stuff. There was something different that researchers thought that may be important to pay attention to and keep track of. And delight was this idea that you were noticing your child and that you are affirming them in their essence, their being. Like, I am just comfortable and happy to be here with you, seeing you do you. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about the definition of delight as being two parts to be seen, the need to be seen and affirmed with joy apart from whether we're doing something well or right or what you want me to do. Delight fills our tanks or fills our sails. There is something about when somebody sees you and looks at you, signals to you that you are valuable to me in your own way of being in the world. It just feels good. Mm -hmm. It's that idea that you are loved apart from anything you do or accomplish. And there is a power in that, that even researchers have come to recognize. And my research in developing a measure of what's going on with the parents in attachment, surprisingly, we didn't expect it, revealed that delight, or the measure of delight, whether we saw it, there was the one thing that most highly connected to that child's security. And that was the big revelation to me. The thing about security that people need to know is that when children feel secure in their relationships with their primary caregivers in particular, it opens up all of these possibilities for them in their development and growth. Children who are secure in their relationships with their primary caregivers grow up to be adults who are more competent in the world, more confident in themselves, and more comfortable in themselves when it feels like a mess inside. When I learned about delight, it really felt like I was getting set free because as a parent, I was always looking at my kids' behaviors and worried that they were maybe doing something wrong or wondering if I should be correcting. And I think learning about their actual foundational need for delight set me free to just love them in a way that I don't know why it was, I needed to hear that. Hopefully other people listening might not be that way, but 
I just found that so fascinating. Loving our kids sets this foundation of security and health and resilience for a lifetime. And then the real kicker to me is how we find this need amplified and underlined in scriptures. Yeah, so my faith journey begins late. I came to faith in Christ in graduate school or just before graduate school. So I had already tracked with this delight business. And then I entered to this phase where I, I was discovering Jesus and what is in the Bible and, and what does it tell us about the human condition. And I came across uh, in particular, not just a, alone, but this, this point in the life of Jesus jumped out of the page. I mean, because of my background in, in the field of attachment, and that is Jesus's baptism. In the baptism of Jesus, we see this story where he goes into the river, religious ritual, dunked in the water, comes out of the water, and the story goes that the Spirit of God descends on Jesus and a voice from heaven declares, this is my beloved son in whom I take great pleasure or in whom I delight. Mm -hmm. And at some point, reflecting on that moment in Jesus's life, I realized, wait a second, this declaration over Jesus happens before he did what he was supposed to do. Right. It's before the miracles. It's before the obedience, before the time in the desert, before the cross, everything. And that mattered because so much of my life, religious sort of training at that point was focused on the goodness of Jesus because of the work he completed, Hmm. right? That's what made Jesus good. And the scriptures were telling me a different story. What made Jesus good was that he was a son. Mm. And we see that story in other places too, the prodigal son story who comes back. He was not a good kid, but the father declares his delight over his return, right? And it, it blows people's minds when we're fixated on the idea of our goodness emanates out of our work. Pride is sneaky. Pride doesn't have this, it actually has the opposite effect on us than delight does. I'm proud of you because you did something in particular that I've decided is important. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we mix those things up because if that's the only time I pay attention to you and smile and clap and cheer, then what I learned from that without anybody preaching to me Mm -hmm. is that you are happy with me when I do what you want me to do, when you told me what, what I've told you to do. Right. But both science and faith are coming together to tell us something so different. It's that what you see in front of you, there might not be much to look at right now. There might be a mess. But it is. (laughs) But declaring our love over them, you are my child, you are my daughter, you are my son, is what sets them free to then go out into the world and do The work that they are meant to do. And And that is such good news. It is such good news. Yeah. We've created the Six Needs Compass to help parents guide their child's journey of growth. It incorporates the instincts of attachment and the six needs of every child into its design. And we hope it will be a life-giving tool for you and your family. The compass is included in our book and it's also available for download at growingconnected.com. Now we're thrilled to welcome our friend Kelly Hampton into this discussion of delight. Kelly is the best-selling author of Bloom, Finding Beauty in the Unexpected, and you may recognize her from her popular blog and social media channels, Enjoying the Small Things. Kelly, thank you for being here. I'm thrilled to talk to you guys today. You have been a friend and encourager to us for so many years, and you are one of the very first readers of our book, which we will always appreciate and cherish. One of the reasons why we wanted to have you on today is I just remember how much the concept of delight jumped out at you as you read it. We'd love to have you talk about what it felt like to read about delight for the first time. What resonated with you? Well, first of all, it's always nice to have people as eloquent as you guys and have Jeffrey's psychology background something that you believe and feel passionate about, but you can't really put words to it. And then when you read it, you're like, yes, that's what I believe. Yes. And so delight has always come easy for me. And that was my favorite chapter just because this is, this is my wheelhouse. This is, and I think part of it might even be just, I'm a former elementary school teacher. I've always feel like I'm a child at heart. There's so much about children in general that I love. I love having children in my house. I love the joy they bring. I like 
I like invitations to be a child. So all these things that we delight with our children, delight in our children, um, these are things that I just love about life in general. And I think children bring that to our homes, especially when they are young. The one thing I, I loved that you pointed out is the different, the, the delight versus affection and the delight versus pride. Um, mm. And that is something that is difficult as a parent. And I think all of us have stories from our own childhood too, where it's so easy to think that my parents delight in me when I blank, when I follow the rules or when I do good or, you know, even I, I didn't play sports, but even thinking with kids when they're playing sports and the parents that go to their sporting events and how easy it is to jump up and down and delight and, and act like you love watching them when they're winning and how much we have to be careful as parents just to delight in our children because they are ours and because they are, you know, wonderful without having to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, such a central distinction. And I think there are a lot of parents, Kelly, who struggle with the idea of expressing positive emotion towards their children, that they're not doing something right, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And really believing that that's how you get, that's how you get kids to do right things, right? By showing uh, positive emotion just around those things that you want them to do. Well, yeah. And then the opposite is true. Then when they're not winning, when they're struggling, when they did something wrong or failed in some way, that they think that their value is decreased, that we love them less. And we do that to ourselves enough, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's so true. It's interesting to think about the long-term effects of believing that we have to earn love and we have to earn love and delight somehow. I know that you and I grew up in similar experiences where I, I think that even though I believe that this is such a, this is the experience of God's love and delight in us is such a foundational part of my faith. It wasn't something that I had learned. And so I just remember crying when I was at one of Jeffrey's first seminars, because it was this idea of like, oh, God loves me. God yeah. loves me. And when we, when we start to believe that about ourselves, I think that's when we can start to pour that into our kids. But if we're holding back, if we can only see the self-doubt and have I earned it, have I done enough? It's very hard, I think, to put that into our kids. You and I have talked about that so much too, because we did both grow up with, you know, God is somebody to be feared and just that we had to have everything in line. And I was so afraid of the rapture growing up and so much of that. And it wasn't until an adult that you do realize, oh my gosh, I am loved for who I am. No matter what, no matter what I do, there is absolutely nothing that you can do. And I, I make it a point to tell my kids this because it was something that I didn't believe about myself is that there is absolutely nothing you could do. You are so loved by me. There's absolutely nothing you can do to lose my delight in you and my love and who you are. Yeah, and I'm curious, what, especially as a teacher and working with children in general, what have you noticed? What, how does it change your children or children that you've worked with and, and seen? What do you see in them when you're really centered in that delight space? I think just the more that we delight in them, they delight in themselves. They're, they're easier on themselves. They're more tolerant of their own failures. Mm. I think you know, it was funny. I was, when I was looking back at this chapter again this morning, I was going back and, and I just thought about, and this to me is like such a guideline in parenting. I think the one thing that we can all agree with, with delight in parenting, it's very easy to talk about delight with babies. Babies are, such a delight. It is so easy to hold a baby and just no matter what they do, it's cute. They coo. I was holding a baby the other day and they were making little sounds and, you know, we've seen how grandparents do it where you're like, tell me a story. Oh, is that what happened? And they're just babbling and we're just listening to every word. And it was my youngest dad's birthday the other day and we were pulling up all these old videos of the kids when they were babies. And I had all the kids huddled around me. We have, it's been a while since we've watched baby videos. And they were watching and you could hear me and Brett in the background cooing and talking to them and tickling them and holding them. And I had tears in my eyes watching my kids watch them. You could tell the look on their faces was just 
They were so, they had so much fun watching themselves be loved as babies because it just, it's so easy to coo and to just talk about you're so cute and you're so wonderful. And I thought for a minute, oh my gosh, do they still, do I still do this? Do they still feel this feeling that they're feeling right now watching these videos of the way that we loved them when they're babies? And so I used that as a guideline. And I, I thought when I was reading this chapter of, a story in my own life that, that is such a great example too of this other hard part about delight, which is delighting in our kids when it's hard. And so I'm going to use that same baby story of when I was pregnant with Nella, my second, and how much I looked forward to the delight that I had had our experience with my first. And just, I knew that this baby is going to be, we're going to bring her home. We get all, you know, everything everyone talks about at baby showers and the cute little clothes and all this delight that was coming and to watch her with a relationship with her older sister. And then when she was born, um, finding out that she had Down syndrome and how crushed I was and how for a moment I thought that that meant that the delight, all the delight that I had expected that I wouldn't have that. And I will tell you, and, and Brett says the same, out of, I think I'll be 80 years old and I will look back and say one of the most delightful years of our entire life was Nella's babyhood. It was the most delightful thing. And just so we, we all, we attach delight so much to like when things are wonderful and when they're babies. And so finding the delight and, and really learning from how to delight in situations and, and in our children when it is hard is something that I'm constantly learning, but it's one of the greatest truths that makes me love my children so much more. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's and I think those unexpected moments of delight are what it's really all about, right? So I hope that other people understanding this concept have the same experience that I did when Jeffrey was, as we were writing the book, Jeffrey was kind of giving me all the data and I'm sifting through it and I'm realizing, oh, this is not only something that's enjoyable, this is actually transformative mm. to our kids. Like actually taking the time, I felt as if I had been set free right? Because so much of parenting is about this feeling of, am I doing enough? Am I correcting enough? Am I pointing them down the right roads? Am I, mm -hmm. you know, how will this all work out in the end if I don't do this right now? And it was just to see this, it was like taking this deep breath of, oh, I can just love them. Now that doesn't mean that other parents, I mean, there's, there are six needs and this is just one of them, right? <laughs> but that it starts with delight. The reason that we made delight the first one on the compass is because it starts there. It's that children being filled with this knowledge of the love that we have for them. And I think as a mom, again, that just sets me free to embrace it. And then in those hard moments, I'll be honest, it also, it reminds me of how important it is mm -hmm. when sometimes when our kids are just so difficult. <laughs> Kelly, you and I have also talked a lot about the hard moments um, mm -hmm. with our kiddos sometimes. And that's also just this reminder they need our love in those moments. We are the we are it for them. We are the ones who can communicate that love to them in a way that they need that will over the long term help them. So true. And that's where I think too we have to get so creative with how to express the light as they get older too. It's it's much easier when they're little. And we can, you know, think of five things right now that are so easy to do to a little kid to show them that we can light in them. And then when they get into those bulky teenagers, that a challenge, but so, so important. That's right. And I, I think about Kelly, your example of, I think most people resonate that it feels much easier with infants to that spontaneous delight. But it begs the question, like, why does it get harder? Why am I not able to do that with my kiddo who's older? Right. Yeah. And I'm, there are a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of pieces that I'm interested in, in some of your thoughts about it. But one of the things that I think is important is as they grow older, they really become their own people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, when they're little, it's like a little package that you've received and you just get to open it up. And it's like, in some ways, we're using it in the sense of like gaining something from it, yeah. right? And, but as, yeah. as they grow older, they're, they're, they're their own people with their own way of being in the world. And 
I think it's hard for us as human beings to make space for somebody who may think different than me, Mm -hmm. react to the world differently than me. And that's where it gets tricky. Like, how do I make space for delight with this person who is not me, who is not just an object that I can cuddle and squeeze and and love on? They're their own person. What does delight look like in Mm -hmm. that context? I ask myself that a lot, especially in moments when it's hard or when you have different kids that have different personalities. And sometimes there's, Mm -hmm. you know, I've got a very quiet one and one that, you know, and so I always sometimes think that we can make things more complex than they are. And sometimes they just go back to the simple, what is the the simple, simplest thing you can do to let them know you delight. And sometimes it is just, I want to be near you. You Mm. make me happy. I'm going to sit next to you. While you play video games, whatever, I just want to sit next to you because you just make me happy. I just, and not to say anything, but just to let them know your presence makes me happy. And I want to, I want to be near you. Um, it might be touch. I and mean, even this morning, we were on our way out the door and it was a rough morning. There was, we were late, there were words, and it was just one of those moments where it did not feel like letting my kids know um, that I delighted them. And at one point, Driving there, I had that moment where I'm like, okay, this is, we're not going to start the day this way. And, and the way that I showed delight was just no words. As I was driving, just reaching my hand back and the two that were in the back just both put their hands in my hand and just squeezing mm-hmm. it. And it was just a silent message of you delight me. You know, the, no matter what, I know it was a rough morning, but I just want to give you a squeeze to let you know nothing has changed in the way that you make me happy. Yeah. That's beautiful. And like the, we talk in the book, the, so this, the first piece of of definition of delight is I see you. Mm. And it can be so hard just to see our children through the busyness and the turmoil of every day, which seems to not end, you know, and that, that touch of the hands breaks, breaks through that moving from A to B barrier and says, I see you, I'm here, you're here, we're still who we are. That's right. (laughs) And that seeing somebody too requires us to take our eyes off something else. And I love how you were defining the difference between delight and affection and that you can give affection while you're scrolling through your phone, but that delight really means Mm -hmm. to give them attention and to really let a child know that you see them means I'm, I'm going to take my eyes off of something else and I'm going to look at you. I, you know, one of the other things that I, I love that it's such an obvious form of delight, and this is something my parents did really well for me. I have vivid memories of a child of walking into a room or waking up in the morning, no matter what age I was. And I remember my mom just gasping, just like, oh, good morning, just this so happy to see me climb out of bed. And I've tried to do that just uh, whether they're waking up, no matter what age they are, or whether I'm picking them up from school and I haven't seen them in a while, just to, to take that gasp and just look at them and just, oh, I'm so happy to see you. I'm so happy you're awake. Mm. Yeah, it's so gorgeous. Yeah, my mom always made a point to do that too. And I, you carry that with you. And I try to carry that. It's interesting how these generational things that we do can really be passed down too, because I just remember as a child what that meant to see someone smile when I walked into the room. And that doesn't mean that everything was going well, but I do think we can make these decisions. And and one other thing that you said, Jeffrey, I'm just thinking about, I see you. When we see our children, we're taking our eyes off of our expectations of them and we're taking our eyes off of our fears about them, which are often mixed up with our love, right? <laughs> but if, if we're just looking right at them and saying, I see you, even for just this moment, this second when I'm reaching my hand back, it's like all those other things that I, I'll just speak for myself. I naturally as a mom am worried about, will this happen today? Did you do this? Will you do this? How will that test go? Et cetera, et cetera. Those things kind of fall away just for that second. And I really do believe that those seconds are what sustains us. So true. Yeah. You know, in psychology speak, and people are probably familiar with this concept of grounding life, and especially for our kids, I think especially for our teenagers right now, uh, sort of generationally, you're seeing a, a lot of anxiety in kids. And as a therapist working with a lot of teenagers who are struggling in that realm, you try and help them feel grounded. We use that word grounded. 
And I want parents to recognize the power that they have in their child's life to ground them, to Mm. center them, to to give them something solid to stand on in a world that doesn't feel so solid, that feels pretty chaotic right now (laughs) Uh, in this past year, can be pretty scary. And these are powerful ways to help your child feel like there's some earth beneath them that they can stand on. I was just thinking that there's delighting in your child. And and then there's also part of that and delighting in them and and showing how much they make us happy is to delight with them and to do some of these things that this is when when they're asking for our attention, they want us to do something with them. And and how many times just like, oh, the last thing I want to do is play Monopoly. I mean, that is like the the worst game. But um, so I, I thought too, just on how much, how important it is to find things that you delight together in. And so there's so much of my delight in my children is just the, the common delights that we have and the things that we do together. And, and I think sometimes it becomes a challenge when it's always something that we don't really want to do, like play Monopoly and how important it is to find things that, that you do enjoy doing together. And so much of our delight has come from, like I said in the beginning, this invitation back into childhood and all these things that as an adult, we forget. And part of the wonder of delight is it makes me happier to do these things with my kids, to make forts and to color with them and to dance in the kitchen and play games and have picnics and read books aloud and do all the voices and you know, all these things are so important, especially right now. Um, and these are, I, again, goes back to that, that whole grounding thing, how much I think like this, these are the memories I want my children to have in this home of what we did together, how much delight we experienced, how much we delighted in them and their presence and what they did and what we did together. And knowing that that will stay with them forever. Actually, that's a really important point, Kelly, because you know, on the one end, I think we started this idea that some parents are going to have a hard time allowing themselves delight in their children because um, delight's not intuitive to them. And I think on the other side, there can be parents who may misconstrue delight as only those things which my children enjoys. Yeah. <laughs> and creating that shared space of delight And having permission to seek out that shared space actually, I think, is important for our own, really important for sustaining delight in our in our mental well-being. There, there are certainly times with certain things with my children that I just enter into their space. You talked about the, you know, watching a video game or whatever. Like that's not my thing, but it it means a lot to to my boys. I take that time to sit down and attend to them in that space. Um, but you're right. Like I've certainly in my own delighting space with my boys tried to find those spaces where it, I, I find some natural delight in what we're doing together as well. Cause if it's all just me trying to do what you want to do, that is, that won't last long. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. And this is where I just have to say to anyone listening, Kelly is the most amazing resource for ideas Mm. and delightful things to do with your family. Uh Anyone I have ever met in my life, she creates these bucket lists that she offers online. There was a free holiday bucket list that I think still might be available with just lists of things to do with your kids. I mean, Kelly, you're so much more creative than I am. What were some of the things on your holiday bucket list? Just things that I wouldn't have thought of, but just to have them listed to me was so helpful. Well, so many of them, and one of mine is, is our summer bucket list is one of my favorites. And that is when I think of delight that we experience as a family together, we'll, I always go to summer, just how much fun and how many things that I think we forget as we get older, things that make us happy. And so we really take time to sit down as a family and think about like, what are things that we want to do that if we don't write them down and hold ourselves accountable, we're going to forget. And there's simple things like lay under the stars one night, have a picnic. Stop at a wildflower field and take pictures in the wildflowers, catch a firefly. These are things that are easy to talk about, but how much of it, how many of us at the end of the summer say, oh yeah, I never did it, you know, do a puzzle together. And so we're really good at holding ourselves accountable. We write them down, we hang it in this main area of the house, we check them off together. And, and we've made this tradition. We do this every holiday. We do it in the summer. We sometimes do a spring bucket list. And sometimes I think if we didn't do this, would I, would I remember to do these things with my kids? 
And then just even like joining our hobbies together. Um, I love photography and art and writing. And I have found this new delight and this new connection with Lainey, my oldest, inviting her into that world. And, you know, instead of me having to stop what I'm doing to go do something that she likes, we've realized that we like to do this together and we'll sit on the floor and cut out things with magazines and collage them and she'll work on her journal and I'll work on mine and I'll take her with me and we'll, we'll do a photo challenge. And um, there's so many things that I think we use a little creativity. We can really experience these areas of joy that we can share with our children um, just by, you know, sometimes it actually takes a sitting down session to sit down and say, what are some things that we want to do? What's something we've never done together as a family that you want to do? What do you love doing if you had a half hour of free time and writing them down and then getting creative on how can we create these moments together as a family? Mm -hmm. That's another brilliant thing you're bringing here (laughs) to the whole discussion, Kelly, because I think a lot of people will look at creativity and think that's just something that some people naturally have and others don't. Um, And one of the central components of delight is this idea of curiosity, right? this discovery, it's a discovery of a person in your midst, right? Mm -hmm. Like who are they? And and you're uncovering facets to them, but it's not something that is simply spontaneous. Like there's also like the structure of the intentionality of it, right? Especially in a world where either we're just so busy because we have all this structure to things that we have to get done, or we're trying to take just a break from it. We're zoning out over something, right? So I think especially in our modern world, that taking the intentional time to create space to discover something, (laughs) and we discover something about ourselves and our children, and then delight emerges, right? Because it's that it's just like you get surprised by something and you're like, that's so cool. Right. It's so cool. And so again, I just, I'll say one more time for (laughs) listeners, if this is not your thing, Kelly is a great resource for you. I mean, you've just been such a wonderful gift to me as a friend and all the things that you do and and encouraging too. And I I also just want to say to people listening, it's so easy to kind of listen to happy, shiny conversations about delight. And I think if things are are hard in our families, we can end up feeling bad. Um, We all have really hard moments when delighting feels hard. I think of particularly when um, after my third was born, I just, I went into a, a pretty deep postpartum depression But understanding, this is also a tool, understanding delight is a tool that in the long run, I think if we can learn how to embrace it, even in teeny tiny ways, we will be grateful that we did because this is not only, we're not only raising our kids, but this is our life too. And I just remember even in the fog um, of everything that I was dealing with, I remember thinking, I want my little guy to see me smile at him. Like I want, so I, I just decided in my mind, I'm going to say, I'm so happy to see you every time I saw him and smiled. And it wasn't an easy time for any of us, but I look back at that with gratitude. And I think about these lists that you create that you say, you know, like let's make hot chocolate or let's sit under the stars or let's do these little things that don't take a lot of money. Um, may take some effort when we're struggling, but in the long run, when we look back years later, we can say, I'm so glad that I have that picture in the wildflower field that we stopped to do. And I love that you said that too, because that is a challenge for myself because I am naturally, I'm an Enneagram seven. I am, let's have a party, let's have a picnic. And so I also think I don't want my children also to only associate delight, to think that delight is always, we have to be doing something, we have to be. And so I challenge myself and in our family and as a parent too, to remember to model to my kids that delight can be quiet. Delight can be Mm. very subtle. Delight can be saying nothing or doing nothing. There is so much delight. I think of even just like the nighttime rituals when we're winding down for the day and how much delight just comes from just being together or when we take the time to actually lay with our children in bed and read or ask them questions or hold their hands. And so delight doesn't always, you know, that's the last thing women need now, parents need is that, you know, one more thing to do or have delight be this, you know, giant pressure. Right. Yeah. We are all in it together. Whatever we're doing. I mean, I just feel like, look, we made it through today. Well done us. It is a hard moment in history, but 
I hope that these tools help. I know I, you have helped me so much, the tools that you offer, Kelly. Um, and I hope that these tools help too, not in a way that makes you feel like, oh, this is one more to do, but actually in the long run to be building health into our kids. Because the interesting thing about delight is how pr- protective it is. That if we find these small moments, if we find these ways to love them over time, it really does build strength and resilience in them. Yeah, Kelly, it's just been such a pleasure hearing from you, your perspective on delight. It, it really enriches my understanding of delight in the real world. Um, and I think uh, I'd say one last thing that I want to draw out is your self-awareness. You know, our children are different <laughs> and you have your own personality and being willing to just own, this is kind of who I am and, and that's okay. I delight in myself. Like I am a kind of person in the world. <laughs> the greatest lesson I've learned in parenting is that mm. none of my children, I mean, my, my, all three of them are probably more like my husband and you know, I, I picture that I was going to have children just like me and they'd like the same things and they'd be, you know, people, enthusiastic, outgoing, and they aren't. And I have learned so much about parenting and love and, um, and, and how to, how to truly love and appreciate and learn from children who are so different from us. Mm, yeah. And that's a gift to you and to your children to enter into that work of just saying, Hey, I'm a kind of person, they're a kind of person. And we are both, all of us loved and lovable. (laughs) (laughs) uh, I'm going to add one thing that is just a silly little thing, but I have found it so instrumental in delight. And that is just in, in the art of taking photos of my children. I am very big into photography. I, photograph my family a lot. And I will tell you from looking at photos and having, having, making family albums and, and both my husband and I, we will, we do this a lot. We'll go in on the computer and look at old photos or we'll sit down together and look at the album. And it kind of gives you this bird's eye perspective where we will look almost to the point of tears sometimes. We'll just look at a photo and just be like, look at them. Like just Look how beautiful our children are. Look at the way that they're looking. Look at oh, look at how confident they look in that photo. And just sometimes when you look through photos or old videos, or it gives you this great perspective to see your children in this way of like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this amazing child is ours, you know. Mm-hmm. And it has really helped me delight in them in a way. It takes it to a new level to, to, and we do it a lot. We're always looking at photos and we look at them as a family, but it's very helpful. Yeah. It's something similar for me. I curate my photos and keep them as a slideshow on my computer, my, Mm. my laptop. And it's amazing how often the boys would just like, once that slideshow started, it was like, it would zap their attention and, and we would all just, look at the photos and it's like a wormhole it takes you to a space that is different than your just day-to-day life i totally affirm that that's great well thank you so much for coming and talking with us kelly we Mm -hmm. love you oh thank you there's nothing i was so excited but you picked delight for me i'm like oh this is so great so thank you thank you for having me if you enjoyed this conversation please subscribe and share and tune in for our next episode when we'll be discussing support the second need on the compass. For an in-depth look at the concepts we discussed today and stories about our family's journey, check out our book, The Six Needs of Every Child, Empowering Parents and Kids Through the Science of Connection. You'll find illustrations of the compass there. We've heard from parents and teachers who want a copy of the compass to hang up, so we've also created a PDF that's available for download at growingconnected.com. And now, may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, find you and hold you today. May you be strengthened and encouraged in ways that surprise you, and may you and your family experience